before we open it up uh, to the floor, I, I kind of wanted to just begin at the beginning of this film journey. If you could both maybe speak to kind of how you got to know each other and how this film came to be in terms of what we see today. <laughs> uh, a shadow of the man I used to be. Uh, um, I, I, um, I quite simply read Gene Cernan's book about nine years ago and was just blown away by it. And uh, before I'd finished reading it, I, I just thought, this is a story I, I have to somehow try and tell. And, you know, the logical thing for me to do at the time was to contact the publisher. And the publisher put me on to Gene's legal representative and thereby began a, you know, a series of emails and ultimately meetings and discussions and time to think about it. And then, I don't know, three years went by and uh, we, we finally got to, you know, make this film and it's a real treat. Uh, it does go back, <coughs> back about eight years, and uh, uh, first of all, let me say I appreciate all you being here. Uh, it's special being in Toronto. Folks here have been just wonderful. We had a great showing earlier of people, and uh, folks like yourself, I appreciate you taking the time and staying this late uh, to be here, because uh, this is this something new to me. Um, Mark did read my book. He was passionate. Uh, I was appreciative of all that, uh, but you want to make a move. Yeah. Why does anyone want to either make or even come to see a movie about me? And uh, the bottom line, once we got into it, and once I got convinced it was worthwhile <laughs> to do, I was convinced, quite frankly, because it was not about me. It was about the story of a young kid with a dream, a dream that eventually took him to, be, to, to the moon, to be able to call him with his home, and that's really what, what the intent, and hopefully young people, young children, your children, your grandchildren, and theirs will see it that way. You know, I, I end the movie, uh, Dream the Impossible, make it happen. If I can walk on the moon, what can't you do? That's the real story. That's the point we're trying to get across. But it is the real world. It really happened. That was really me in there. It's not some Hollywood fiction of somebody's good idea. And, you know, so here we are, and thanks to Mark, and thanks to you folks out there, I'm on this stage tonight. Uh, who knows where I'd be if I wasn't here. <laughs> well, we're certainly glad you're here. Uh, and so I want to open up to the floor, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said, if you do have questions, I'm going to try and find you. Someone's running with the mic to the corner. So uh, tonight, it's a, almost a full moon out right now. Um, um, when you get a chance tonight, do you look up and see if you can spot Taurus Litro? Well, now that you remind me that it is a full moon, and generally, I, you know, I don't live in the past. I don't mean to minimize uh, what I've had the opportunity to do, but I don't live in the past. I live in the future uh, as much as I can. Uh, uh, but every once in a while, someone will say, what does it look like? What does it feel like when you're looking out the street, looking at a full moon? We'll probably do that tonight. Mark will probably say, what did it really feel like? <laughs> uh, and it gets a little nostalgic because, yes, I can see Taurus Lecho. I can see it from here and I can see it from there. I know what it looks like from within, standing in that valley, and I know where it is when I look at it from here. And it's, it's, uh, sounds crazy, doesn't it, for me to stand here and talk to you about having lived on the moon for three days of my life. But it's, 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 it's one of those pieces of my life that I've just had to reconcile over the years. I'm proud of it. Uh, I know my name's in history books. I, I look at this movie. It may be something I could leave to my grandkids. They'll remember who I was and what I did. But yeah, it's, it's visible up there and it's visible in here. We'll move up to the balcony. Uh, hi, uh, over here. Uh, congratulations, first of all, a beautiful film. Um, my question is uh, two part. One, uh, Gene, how does it make you feel uh, when you hear uh, people online comes up every now and then uh, about the lunar landing potentially being a hoax? Obviously, by the, the <laughs> film tonight, we all know we all know you know where we stand on that. But just curious how that makes you feel when you hear stuff like that. And the other question that I have uh, very briefly is: uh, Was there anything during your time uh, in the space program uh, that would lead you to believe there's life off of Earth? 
I'm not sure I got the last one. What was? Yeah. So, so the first part of the question is. Well, I got the first. Yeah. One. <laughs> <laughs> Let me answer the first one. You know, when you get to be a certain point in your life where uh, you put something in here and you got to take something out of here to remember what was just said. Uh, you know, I've had those. I've had that question asked a lot about whether we really went to the moon. We did it in Arizona. People who really don't want to believe that we did come with all these good reasons why we didn't. They can prove this again. Listen, I don't care what they think. I went to the moon. Those are my footsteps. If you, if you don't believe me, go back and check. And we've, had, <laughs> we've had we've had low flying unmanned spacecraft take pictures. I think I've got them on my iPhone. Of the Apollo, of all of the sites, and it's very vivid of about of Apollo 17, and you can see our rover tracks, you can see where our lunar descent stage was. Uh, as someone, when I, you can see where I parked the rover. Someone even said one time to me, Gene, why did you leave the wheels of the rover turn to the left? And I said, What are you talking about? He says, Well, I can see it. He he could he used the right technique to be able to actually see that kind of resolution. And for those people who don't believe that we actually went to the moon, all I can say to them is you just missed living through one of the greatest adventures in the history of mankind. And the second question uh, was uh, about a belief in a different sense. Uh, in terms of like your journey, was there any kind of opinions or thoughts or feelings you have in terms of potential life on other planets, other worlds? Well, we hear a lot of things about UFOs and life elsewhere. I'll give you my opinion, it's just my opinion. First of all, I've been in space three times and I'm one of the few guys who have been out to the moon twice. So if anyone has had a chance to see a UFO or anything we can identify, I put myself in that category. And I have never, I'd like to say I have, <clears throat> but if I told you, I'd probably have to shoot you off. <laughs> <laughs> but I really honestly have never seen anything that I could not identify, a piece of spacecraft, a star, uh, a, 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 whatever it may have been. But let me say this, when statistically, you look at the number of jillions of stars and planets that are out there, some of which we haven't even seen yet, many of which probably have atmospheres and environments like us. But how do you define life? Maybe that life out there doesn't need our kind of atmosphere. Statistically, there has to be life on other places out in this universe. Philosophically speaking, very spiritually speaking, if you stood on God's front porch, where I stood, stood and lived and looked back at the beauty of the earth, an earth that wasn't moving aimlessly through space, it wasn't tumbling and moving with logic and purpose, an earth that was just too beautiful to have happened. Our home, our star, uh, multicolors of the greens, or, or the blues of the oceans and the whites of the snow and the clouds. A small part, and if you believe there is a creator, if you do believe there is a creator in this universe, whoever your God may be, uh, as I do, uh, then why should we be so arrogant to believe that that creator, our God, didn't create life somewhere else in this universe? The universe, my belief, belongs, was created by God, belongs to all of us. And to think there is life on this tiny little place we call Earth. <laughs> Nowhere else is, I think, very arrogant thinking. We'll just move down to the front. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for what you and all your fellow astronauts and, and members at NASA did, because for me and my generation, when we were little pipsqueaks, you were a great inspiration. That led us to do a lot of great things in our own lives. But for many of us, Apollo 17 was the most spectacular of the six lunar missions. And um, I'd like to ask you, perhaps words that we could pass on to our grandkids, what was the most spectacular moment for you on that very spectacular mission? Well, first of all, I appreciate your saying thanks, because I hear that from a lot of 40, 50 year old young folks. <laughs> uh, because, you, you know, 
I hear I became a doctor, I became a school teacher, I became an engineer, uh, I became a scientist because of what pointed at me what you did. My answer to that is it wasn't me. It was what what we were doing as a nation, if I can be a little parochial at that time. It was what the you were inspired by what was going on at that point in time. Not by any individual, but by what was going on and what could be done if we really believed in accepting a challenge and a risk that went with it. And that's, I think, where you got your inspiration. And I, I keep going back to looking back there. The memory you could never erase in your mind is looking at the beauty and purpose uh, of the earth itself. But I, I, I got to admit, uh, going to the moon is like putting links in a chain. You know, you gotta take them out to get home. And there's one place where the chain stops. There's no, many, no more links to put it. And that's when you land and you shut down the engine, you shut down the, you turn the computer off, you turn the inertial uh, uh, guidance system off, goes belly up, everything except the environmental control system which keeps your spacecraft pressurized and gives you the oxygen and the breathing. The reason I say that's a link in a chain because after you're there three days, and I grew up in Chicago, this is Toronto, you know what happens on a cold winter day when the night before there was ice all over your automobile and you shut the ignition off. And the next morning you gotta get up and the ice is still there. It's zero degrees, the wind's blowing, and you put the key in and you say, God, I hope it starts. <laughs> I've been there. I've been there when it didn't start. What I'm saying is that's that's when you, it, it, you know what? That's when things that's when things get a little interesting. Fortunately, it all worked. Was, was, did we have a way out? Was there someone to rescue us? No. That's one of the bullets you buy to have the opportunity to go to the moon because you think it's the right thing to do. And it's, I had someone interviewed me the other day and asked me about the right stuff. That's a Hollywood term. That, that's this Superman coming with a big silver cape rescuing the damn soul from the bad guy, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You know what the right stuff is? And I gotta believe everyone in this room has the capability to have the right stuff. It's when you believe, and this is what I think got us to the moon, it's when you believe that what you're doing is the right thing to do. And you're willing to accept the challenge and take the risk to get it done. You've got the right stuff. Whether it's being a school teacher, whether it's being an engineer, whether it's being a fighter pilot, whatever it is, if you're willing to accept the challenge and take the risk, you've got the right stuff. And that's and that's what not just those of us who went to the moon has. It's the people who were, were making it possible for us to get there. Everyone who made a decision in the management ranks were taking a risk. Or accepted the challenge were taking a risk. Everybody who put the nut and bolt, <coughs> bolts that held the heat shield on was taking a risk. They accepted the challenge of making sure it wouldn't fail. They were taking a risk that it would, but we went, when, when we went to the moon, we had a lot of people on board that spacecraft. Everybody who did anything, uh, including the final push button that lifted us off from, from the very first wire that was put through that spacecraft, took ownership of that spacecraft. That was their spacecraft. And they were not going to let their part of their spacecraft fail. They had the right stuff for were willing to accept that challenge and take the risk. They were part of it. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's the way I feel. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Chris Jolly. The, the film was beautiful. It's very inspiring, and it's I, um, I feel inspired by it to go for what I want. And and thank you uh, to the filmmaker and to, and to Eugene. 
Um, my question is is that like for the for the past for the past forty years there's been we've been to the moon and now there's been the ISS and then and we've had a, and we, today we have a whole new generation of astronauts that are going to the ISS and and doing science up there, but we've never been back to the moon. Do you think, in your opinion, will will we return to the moon, and in, at, at what capacity will we? Yeah. So yeah. So so the question uh, pertains to um, all the kind of amendments we've made to the International International Space Station, but uh, do you think, kind of maybe in both your opinions, uh, is there a way for people to go back to the moon and is there kind of a reason to? We are going back to the moon and you will see, those of you who are young enough, will see human beings walk on Mars. It's, Curiosity is the essence of human existence. Who are we? Where are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going? Is there anyone else on? Uh, what is it like to look back at the Earth from Mars? I'll never know. I know what it's like to look back from the Earth, but yet yeah, the answer to the question, we will go to the moon and on the Mars. We had a program that we spent a lot of time and money on that was canceled about six years ago that was going to take us back there certainly back to the moon in the early 20s and then on to Mars in the 30s. We might be a generation later than that now, but we will go. We will do it. What we're doing now in space is important, but I call it exploitation of space. We're going to take what we've learned from space and exploit our capabilities in their Earth orbit and learn more. But we're doing it at what I believe is the cost of exploration of space, to go once again where no human has gone before, to see once again has never been seen with human eyes before. Yes, the answer is that from my point of view. It's in our genes. We will do that. I mean, there's not really much I can say to top that, but I, I, I know Gene is very much an advocate of, you know, boots on the ground, as, as it were. You know, you, you need eyes in the field. You, you need, you know, the, the human endeavor. To, to go out. Uh, that, that's what people really get uh, behind. Uh, um, and of course it's fantastic that we've got incredible robots on Mars and we've got telescopes pointing to parts of the universe, we, 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 you know, to worlds we couldn't have imagined before. But um, um, I know one of your favorite expressions is, uh, no one ever became a robot at Ticket Tape Parade. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Okay. <laughs> How did you think of What were you thinking about? What did it look like? Were you scared? Did you feel any closer to God? I get those questions all the time, a robot, and not answer those questions. I want to answer those questions of that first person who goes to Mars. A robot, I can't. We got a, we got a couple of them up there now, trying to run around the surface. They don't have the answers to those questions, but a human being will. Why did Columbus sail across the ocean? Why did the other explorers, uh, you know, discover the rest of the world? We have, we have time for one more question, and we're going to move down to the floor. It's been past long. Thank you, Gene, for sharing from your life and being a part of a great presentation for us to see and for others to see it beyond this evening. Are you sure of your faith and your belief that there's a creator that made the universe? I wonder specifically if you believe that Jesus Christ is that creator. Um, and wonder your thoughts on that. Thank you. Is there, I mean, uh, the question is maybe in, in terms of uh, like your faith and if you believe that perhaps Jesus Christ was our Lord and Savior, dare I say. Uh, I mean, in terms of uh, like your faith, you, you've been outspoken even like in the film and uh, here today in terms of your beliefs. Uh, and if you could speak to maybe uh, your beliefs, do they extend beyond just a creator or onto Jesus Christ? Or a creator or what? <laughs> to Jesus Christ. 
No, I, you know, everyone has their own religion. That's not a religious statement on my part. That's a spiritual statement. There is a creator. We all have our own God. Some of us have the same God. Uh, I don't care about what name you call your God or how you dress him or her. That's up to you. But I can tell you above, above religion is man-made. Above our belief in our God, there is a creator of the universe. I, I can't explain any, that's just my feelings. And, you, and you, I came to that conclusion on Apollo 10 when I went to the moon and looked back. Too beautiful to have happened by accident. I reinforced that feeling on Apollo 17. So please don't take that as a religious statement. Your God is whoever you want your God to be. All I'm saying is I know that the universe did not come about by accident. It didn't start with two dust particles colliding and creating mass and energy and life. I can't prove it. I just know it. If I could take every human, thank, thank you. If I could take every human being on the earth today, every one of them, stand alongside me on the moon for five minutes, I guarantee you this would be a different world we live in. Yeah. Uh, a couple of quick uh, final notes here. Uh, we uh, do have time, uh, if you guys do want to have a few more questions and take some photographs, uh, we will move to the lobby. Unfortunately, we don't have time for autographs, but you can definitely take a quick snapshot uh, just outside in the lobby. But finally, the, the note that you mentioned about robots and ticker take parades, I just want to say we're certainly so glad that we don't have a robot here, uh, but we were all so delighted that we have not only Captain Eugene Cern, but Mark Craig. Thank you so much for being here.